Today I want to tell you about a fairly modern addition to mathematics, and that is the idea of a universal property. So let's look at a really casual idea of what a universal property is. So given some sort of object mapping or what have you, a modern way of describing it is not using the traditional definition, but instead by some universal property. And the object in question is the only thing that satisfies this universal property. Furthermore, often this universal property is simpler to state than the traditional definition, but yet it's also more abstract. So this fits in the natural evolution of mathematics to become more abstract over time. But in order to describe things naturally and really in the end in more simple terms. So let's look at an example of this kind of path using the integers and addition, which is a really standard example of a group. And so you would start with something like a first example. Like I pointed out, like the integers with addition. So those are positive and negative whole numbers. And you know, when you add them together, they have some nice properties. And then from there, you would like maybe look for some more examples. And so looking for some more examples of objects that satisfied the same types of properties that we had before, you might find, well, the integers modulo n, which we've talked about on the channel before. You might find the real numbers together with addition, the complex or the rational numbers together with addition. You could also find the non-zero rational numbers with multiplication or some other things as well. And then you might say, well, all of these objects had this commutativity property. Well, what if we could like get rid of the commutativity property? Would we maintain a nice structure still? And that would be maybe the next step. You would look at all of your examples and see if you could get rid of a property and find some other nice examples. So in this case, you know, in our outline, we're talking about commutativity. And in fact, you can. You would find the matrix groups, dihedral groups, symmetric groups, and so on and so forth. So there are lots of nice examples of groups that don't commute. And then from there, you would maybe write down a general definition. So after studying lots of these examples, you would see some sort of properties that these examples satisfy, and that would lead you to a general definition. And so in the case of a group, it would be something like a group is a set together with an operation so that you have an identity, you have inverses, and you have associativity. Then, after you have that general definition, you would start to develop a general theory. And maybe if you're taking an Introduction to Abstract Algebra class, like I have on my second channel, go check it out if you're interested, you might learn about cyclic groups. You might learn about the isomorphism theorems, normal subgroups, quotient groups, CELO theory, and so on and so forth. And often those are done in some sort of general setting. And then, after looking at all of those examples, as well as the starter of the general theory, you might discover some universal properties. And maybe in this abstract algebra class, one of the universal properties that you would prove is that every infinite cyclic group is isomorphic to the integers. So, put very simply, a cyclic group is a group generated by one element. Well, and the integers are also generated by one element, and that's the number one. You can get to any integer by adding one to itself, or maybe adding negative one to itself. Okay, so now that we have this general outline, as well as this like casual description over here, I want to highlight the idea of universal properties with two concrete examples. So the first one of these universal properties that we'll look at is the derivative, and this is probably familiar to most of the people watching. So what we will end up showing is that the only linear map that goes from polynomials to polynomials, which we'll call D, satisfying these two rules is the derivative. Well, what are those two rules? Well, D of X equals one, and then D of F times G is D of F times G plus F times D of G. This looks like the product rule. And so if you recall the definition of the derivative, had something to do with finding the slope of the tangent line, and that isn't here at all. These are just two properties that you end up proving later in the game. 
and it turns out that at least if you restrict yourselves to polynomials, and that's all we'll do here because that's the simplest case, all you need is these two properties and then you must have the derivative. So let's recall what a linear map is. So it means that you can split this map up with the sum. So in other words, d of f of x plus g of x is d of f of x plus d of g of x. And you can also factor out a constant. So d of alpha of f of x is equal to alpha times d of f of x, where alpha is, well, let's say a real number. Let's say we're working over the real numbers here. Okay, so let's notice by the linearity, all we have to do is prove the power rule. And why is that? Well, that's because now if we were to take d of, let's say, a n x to the n plus a n minus 1 x to the n minus 1, all the way down to a1x plus a0, using linearity, we can just split this up. So this would be an dxn plus all the way down to maybe a1 dx plus a0 times d1. We might as well pull the a0 out of d1. And then notice that if we know this, then we can apply that to every part of the sum here and then, well, we've got the derivative because everything is built off of this power rule, at least when you're working with polynomials. Okay, so let's like maybe start by noticing that we have the n equals one case done. So that means we need to look at the n equals zero case and then we'll look at a couple more cases and then make a little bit of an inductive argument. So for the n equals zero case, we can look at d of one, that's like x to the zero. That's the same thing as d of one times one because well, one times one is one. But then using the second rule, that's the same thing as d of one times one plus one times d of one. Again, using this like, well, it's technically called the Leibniz rule. But adding those two things together, we get two times d of one. But now what do we have? We have a number, d of one, is equal to twice a number. Well, I guess that could be a polynomial. So a polynomial is equal to twice itself. But the only thing that is its own double is, well, the number zero. So we have d of one is equal to zero. Okay, so there we have it for the n equals zero case. Maybe we'll insert the n equals one case here just like to for completeness. This is assumed. Great. And then moving on, let's look at the n equals two case. So for the n equals two case, we'll take d of x squared. That's d of x times x. But now we'll apply that Leibniz rule. That'll give us d of x times x plus x times d of x. But one of our assumptions is that d of x equals one. So that tells us that this term right here is equal to one as well as this term right here. So we end up with x plus x, which is two x, which means for x squared, this rule does hold. Now maybe we'll do the n equals three case by hand as well before moving on to the general case. So here we have d of x cubed. That's the same thing as d of x times x squared by exponent rules with multiplication. But now that'll turn into d of x times x squared plus x times d of x squared. Okay, nice. But we know that d of x equals one by our assumption and we know d of x squared is equal to 2x by the previous line. So in the end, we'll have x squared plus 2x squared, which is exactly 3x squared. So that means we're satisfied for x cubed. Now let's look at the n equals n case. And here we're gonna make an inductive argument, so I won't write this down carefully, but we'll assume that everything is covered up to the n minus one case. Now let's look at d of x to the n. We can write that as d of x times x to the n minus one, and then pull that apart. This is d of x times x to the n minus one plus x times d of x to the n minus one, like that. But we know that d of x equals one by our assumption, 
And by our induction hypothesis, by assuming that everything's good up to this point, we know that d of x to the n minus one is n minus one times x to the n minus two. But now notice we multiply an x into that, giving us an x to the n minus one, and then adding it with this other term, we get exactly what we need, n times x to the n minus one. So that finishes this proof over here. So yes, the derivative satisfies this universal property, which is somewhat simpler than the definition of the derivative and more abstract. Let's look at another example. So for our next example, we're gonna look at the determinant. So if you've taken linear algebra, you're probably fairly familiar with the determinant. And what we'll prove, well, we'll prove a special case of this because it's not really that fun to get into the weeds without like a bigger setup than we'll do. So we'll prove that the only alternating multilinear function from n copies of Rn to R such that f of e1, e2 up to en is equal to one is the determinant. Well, what do I mean by these ei's? Well, I mean the standard basis vectors. So e1 would be the vector with a one in the first entry and zeros everywhere else, and so on and so forth. So like I said, we're gonna focus on the n equals two case, and let's see what alternating means in that case. So f of vw is negative f of wv. So if you swap the entries, you pick up a minus sign. But notice if you swap an entry with itself, you still pick up a minus sign. But that means you would get something equal to its negative. Oh, but that means that f of vv is equal to zero because the only thing equal to its negative, inside of r at least, is the number zero. Next up, it has to be multilinear. So that just means it needs to be linear in each entry. So I've written that down here. So f of alpha u plus beta v comma w is alpha f of u w plus beta f of v w. So notice I was able to split it up with respect to addition and then factor the constant out, the scalar if you will. And then it's also linear in the second entry. So f of u comma alpha v plus beta w is alpha f of u v plus beta f of u w. So again, we split that addition up and factored the constants out. And then what is this last condition in the n equals two case? Well, it says that f of one zero comma zero one is equal to one. And you might say, well, the determinant has to do with matrices and this is just like a bunch of copies of Rn. Well, that's because you can think about n copies of Rn as being an n by n matrix. Or in general down here, we have two copies of R2 can be thought of as a two by two matrix like this. Okay, so the proof of this, at least in the n equals two case, is fairly straightforward. So let's look at F evaluated at A comma B or AB comma C comma D. So those are our two entries. So again, we're thinking about this as F evaluated at the two by two matrix A, B, C, D. Okay, so now we can split up each entry here with respect to the sum of maybe their components. So this would be in the first component, A zero plus zero B. And then in that second component, it would be C zero plus zero D. Okay, nice. And now from here, we can use this rule. Maybe we'll use this rule with the sum in both entries, but that's gonna split this up into four pieces. So notice we'll have the F of A zero comma C zero plus F of A zero comma zero D, that would be the next piece, F of zero B comma C zero. And then finally F of, let's see, zero B comma zero D. Okay, so that's applying the sum part of this rule. And now we can apply the scalar multiple part of this rule and bring the constants out. Using the fact that A times one is equal to A, B times one is equal to B and so on and so forth. So for this first term, we can bring an A times C out. 
and that leaves us with f evaluated at these two vectors, 1, 0, and 1, 0. And now you might say, well, I know that's 0 by this alternating thing here, and we'll get to that. And then for our next term, we can bring the a times d out, and we'll have f of 1, 0, comma, 0, 1. And now you might say, well, I know that's 1 because that's our given down here. Okay, we'll get to that as well. Then for this next bit, we can bring a b times c out, and then we have f of 0, 1, comma, 1, 0. And then finally for this last one, we can bring a b, d out, and we have f of 0, 1, 0, 1. Okay, now let's get rid of all the stuff that we know is 0 by the fact that this is alternating. So using this part of the alternating. So that means this turns into 0. That also means that this turns into 0 because it's f evaluated at the same vector twice. Okay, but then let's peer into the rest of this. Notice that by our given, we have this is equal to 1. But then by alternating, this term right here is equal to negative f of 1, 0, 0, 1 because we can swap the entries. So that's equal to negative 1. So now putting this all together, we have ad times 1 plus bc times negative 1, in other words, minus bc. But that's exactly the determinant of the 2 by 2 matrix a, b, c, d. So we showed that if a function, at least in the 2 by 2 case, we showed that if a function satisfied these two rules, it had to be the determinant, meaning that the determinant satisfies this universal property. And that's a good place to stop.